Welcome to the Professor Network. Today we've got with us Dr. James Danker, who is a professor and the head of the Cognitive Neuroscience Research Area at the University of Waterloo. We're so happy you could join us to talk about the extremely cool stuff you do. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, so now I know you run the Danker Lab at UW where, that primarily studies boredom and mental model updating. Could you elaborate on that for me and maybe talk to me about current projects your lab is working on? Sure. So as you say, we have two main research programs, one to study the cognitive and the neural basis of boredom, which is an experience that I think most of us have. Um, but really, research hasn't done a lot about it until the last 10 years or so. Um, and then the other thing that we do is we look at mental model building. So I'll get to those in, in turn. So from the point of view of boredom, I want to know what it is that, that leads to the experience. I want to also know um, what it is about different individuals that makes them more or less prone to boredom. We have a lot of projects on the go. Um, so we're looking at decision making and boredom. Do high boredom prone people make risky decisions? We're looking at brain activity. So we look at EEG uh, while people do these kinds of decision making tasks and while they do attention tasks. So do we see different uh, brain signals associated with high and low boredom proneness? We have a really interesting study with um, a colleague at the University of Toronto where we're looking at the genetic profile of boredom proneness. So we're looking at self-regulation, self-control, um, these kinds of things, uh, and, and then looking at various genes that are related to those things and, and seeing whether or not we can get a genetic profile of the high boredom prone individual. Um, and then we do lots of different sort of just behavioural in-lab tasks and surveys, questionnaire sort of tasks to look at things. One of the other things that we're interested in um, moving forward now, and this is just, we're just starting this kind of thing, is to understand the link between boredom and depression. Mm -hmm. So which one comes first? And we sort of suspect that boredom is a risk factor for depression okay. and also boredom and traumatic brain injuries. So if you have had some sort of concussive brain injury in the past, does that make you more susceptible to boredom? The other stuff that we do, the mental model building, that's more about um, the, the, the two things and uh, sort of tangentially related, but pretty different. Um, and the mental model building is more about the fact that we can't possibly represent everything that's out there in the world. There's too much sensory information and it's changing too quickly. So what we need to do is we need to create mental models, representations of the world in our mind that help us predict the consequences of various action choices. So if I go to the left, what's the world going to look like? If I go to the right, what's the world going to look like? That's a very simple sort of decision-making task that you might have to do. Um, so your mental models have, are only as good as their accuracy, how well they predict changes in the world. And they're only as good as their flexibility. So how easily can you update your mental model when things in the world change? So we're very interested in how the brain achieves that. And to that end, I work with uh, Britt Anderson, uh, who's in the Department of Psychology as well. And we, we do a lot of work with people who've suffered strokes. So brain injuries that uh, affect your ability to accurately represent the world and, and update it. So those are the two big research programs that we run. That's fantastic. What's part the interest in this area? Well, so I'll, I'll start with the mental model first and then go to the boredom. The mental model stuff started from neglect. So a lot of, lot of first-year students will be familiar with that syndrome of, of unilateral neglect where the patient sort of behaves as though the left side of the world has ceased to exist. It's typically right. a from mm -hmm. right parietal damage. Um, and so people have talked about that disorder as being a disorder of attention. But both Britt Anderson and myself felt like that was an inadequate description of neglect. And so that's what sparked our interest in trying to understand mental model building. Perhaps the neglect patient doesn't just have trouble attending to the left, but they have trouble representing it accurately. Right. The boredom stuff is a little bit different. I think you'll find, I, I don't know how many of my colleagues will be willing to admit this, but I think you'll find that a lot of professors um, do what we sort of call physician heal thyself. That is that they, you, you study what you're not good at or you study what you don't like about yourself. Um, my wife, who did her PhD in the psych department here, 
she studied memory because she has none. She's got a hopeless memory. She, she says that she actually uses me as her memory. Um, I studied boredom because I experience it a lot and I hate it. I, I really don't like it. So that's, that's one reason that got me interested in boredom. But the other reason is that, you know, as a young man, um, my older brother, who was 18 months older than me, and he and I were, were very close growing up, um, he had a motor vehicle crash when um, he was about 20 and suffered a fairly severe traumatic brain injury. And during, and at this point, I'm just in my undergraduate degree. Um, and during his recovery from that brain injury, he would tell me that he was bored a lot and he was more bored than he was before his injury. And he was bored with things that he used to find really engaging. And I guess I found that both fascinating and I thought it was also important because if he was bored all the time, then how was he going to get his life back on track? How was he going to be able to sort of reestablish, um, uh, you know, the, the life the way he wanted it to be? So then I, I also sort of had an experience in undergraduate at the University of Melbourne. Um, I, I had a lecture from a guy called Michael Saling. And it's that lecture that a lot of undergraduates report, you know, the one about Phineas Gage, where we hear about this guy that has tamping iron go through his, his skull. When I teach that now, I teach uh, as much about the myth of Gage as, as the reality, because we don't know much about the reality. But I found that lecture fascinating, and I really wanted to understand more about how the frontal cortex in the brain, that part of the brain that was damaged in my brother, um, how that part of the brain might be important for so con controlling our most important behaviours. So those three things sort of brought me to my interest in boredom and trying to understand what's happening in the brain when we're bored. I That's incredible. I think my main takeaway from that is if you want to excel in your particular area of research, like pick things you're interested in and are applicable to your own life. Um, you also, I know that you got your Bachelor of Arts in Melbourne. How did you end up in Waterloo? <laughs> yeah, so when you study in Australia, and this is going to age me if, I'm, if I don't already look old enough as it is, but I finished my undergraduate degree in 1994, and then I finished my graduate work in 1999. Um, and at that time, uh, it was still important for Australians who were doing science and doing research like I was to then go overseas for some period of time and do what's called postdoctoral research. And so that was my plan. And the reason for it is that, you know, Australia is fairly isolated. It's hard to collaborate with other internationally renowned scientists. And so you really it, it sort of leave the nest, get out of Australia, get out from your, your sort of scientific parentage and go and uh, learn something new from experts in, in uh, another part of the world. And so typically Australians will go to either Europe or North America. So I interviewed for a postdoctoral position at the University College in London with a guy called John Driver. And then I interviewed with um, a guy called Mel Goodale at the University of Western Ontario. And it was just really clear to me from both of those interviews, I just liked the Canadian system better. It just seems like the Canadians were more relaxed. Uh, it, was, it was just a, a more collegial sort of atmosphere. Um, and I just thought, you know, I can, I can live in Canada and I can enjoy my time there more than I could if I went to the UK. So the plan was to come to Canada for a maximum of about two years, maybe three, and then return to Australia and, and start my, my career in Australia. But it turns out that um, I, I met my wife here and she's Canadian. Um, and so I got trapped. Oh, no. well, we're so glad you got trapped. Oh, my gosh. Um, okay, well, thank you so much for talking to me about that. Um, finally, um, we have a question that incoming students have submitted saying, um, for an undergraduate student who may be considering embarking on the long road of academia that you've gone through, um, what's something you would want them to think about or consider? Well, you touched on one earlier, and that is, you know, follow your passions, follow the things that you're most interested in. It doesn't necessarily like the story I tell about my brother. It doesn't have to be something that's personal in your life, you know, that you know, some family member has suffered a particular psychological illness or injury, and so you want to pursue that. Sometimes that's a bit fraught with, with danger. You know, it's, it, it, you're sort of too personally connected in some sense. But it is important that you're passionate about what you do. You, you, this is a difficult road. So if you sort of see yourself getting into my chair and, and, and doing my job, then, yeah, it, it takes a lot of hard work um, and, and 
a lot of discipline and that is a lot easier to do if you if the thing that you're doing is something you're really curious about and you're really passionate about the only other thing i think i'd say is be open to serendipity um so i don't think that a first year student has to decide now what they're going to do in year four or in masters or in a phd i'll often say to upper year level undergraduates it doesn't really matter what you do for your honors thesis it just matters that you do it well and then when you get into a master's degree you might you want to choose something that you're passionate about but you might change your mind at the end of that master's degree and want to do a phd in something else and then the beauty of science is that when you finish the phd you can go and do a postdoctoral fellowship in some other area as well so be open to change and open to serendipity you just you know one of the things i think is sort of anxiety provoking about coming into to your undergraduate degree and then thinking about what you do after it is that there's a lot that's unknown i would embrace that unknown don't worry about it let it sort of open doors for you that you can't even imagine are there right now be open to serendipity i think that's the best thing i've heard all day and i'm going to like keep that in mind while i apply to grad programs this fall um, thank you so much for speaking to us. We're so happy you took out the time from your day to do this. It's my pleasure. Thank you for setting it up.